The International Anthony Burgess Foundation Podcast, Episode 3, One Hand Clapping and Tremor of Intent. Both One Hand Clapping and Tremor of Intent, republished this year by Serpent's Tale, have their beginnings in Bradcaster, Burgess's fictional rendering of his own Manchester. Bradcaster is described as a northern town full of plain-speaking people, such as Janet Shirley in One Hand Clapping. It has an atmosphere that smells of tanneries, breweries, dray horses, canals, dirt in old crevices, brick dust, the wood of tram benches, hash, hot pies with gravy, cow heel stew, beer. In 1973, Burgess told the Paris Review about his memories of Manchester, the results are remarkably similar to this description of Bradcaster. I always associated Manchester with the smell of tanneries, very pungent smells, as you know. I got the same smell out of Leningrad. It's a small thing, but these small things have a curious habit of becoming important. I don't know what the smell of Milwaukee is. I don't think American cities have any smell. That's probably why they are rather unmemorable. Smell is the most elusive of the senses. To a novelist, it is somehow the most important of the senses. In 1959, Burgess was struck down by a mysterious illness, after which he retired as a schoolteacher and became a professional writer. One Hand Clapping was one of the novels he wrote in a frantic year of activity, thinking he did not have long to live. It was published in 1961 under John Burgess Wilson's second pseudonym, Joseph Kell. Burgess's publisher, startled by the sheer output of work in the years after the diagnosis, thought it would be best to use a second pen name to avoid the risk of flooding the market with new novels by Burgess. Joseph Kell was born, his name coming from the Book of Kells, a 6th century illustrated manuscript of the Gospels, which was kept for several centuries at Kells Abbey in Ireland. Joseph was the name of Burgess's father. The fact that One Hand Clapping was chosen to be published under Kell's name emphasises its unusual place in Burgess's bibliography. Burgess's usual verbose and learned style is absent from the book. Instead, it focuses on Janet Shirley, a narrator who speaks in a simple, northern voice, with few of the flourishes usually found in a Burgess novel. Here, Janet introduces her story in a typically straightforward manner. I was Janet Shirley, no bounds, And my husband was Howard Shirley. And in this story, he was nearly 27 and I was just gone 23. We lived on the Shortshaw Council Estate in North Bradcaster. Number four, Cranmere Road, off Whitgift Road, which leads into town. And we paid 32 and six a week rent. Just up the road from us was, and is I guess, Shoe Lane, which was on the TV commercials as Shining Shoe Lane, which made all those that lived there very boastful in a silly way as if they'd done something clever. The first edition's jacket copy was written by Burgess himself in a similar style to this narrative. It describes a story that still has resonances in today's world of televised talent shows and intense lust for the trappings of fame and fortune. In this story, the young married couple are an ordinary decent young married couple like what you and I are, only better looking, perhaps. It's all about the husband having a sort of brain good at winning quizzes. So he wins the big money on a TV quiz, and then he puts the money on horses, and he becomes a rich man. And so then they have the best of everything, like a mink for her, and staying at posh hotels, and travelling to America and the West Indies and such like places. But there's always been something niggling in him all the time about the world being a rotten place, and not even money can buy anything to make the world a less rotten place, so he suggests they do themselves in. This blurb by Burgess does not reveal the novel's depth of satire and its central concern, the ailing condition of English culture. 
The focus of this is television, something that Burgess sees as a superficial and reductive force in modern society. When Howard appears on the quiz show, he earns big money by answering questions about literature, but all the questions need are factual answers. Burgess's television show is processing the depth experience of great literature into a superficial and useless set of facts. In 1964, three years after One Hand Clapping was published, life would imitate art to a certain degree. Burgess appeared on the literary quiz show Take It or Leave It, hosted by the novelist and critic Robert Robinson, who went on to host other television quiz shows such as Call My Bluff and Ask the Family. The format involved an actor reading out extracts from novels and the contestants, including Burgess, novelist Bernadine Bishop and critic John Gross, guessing which book the quotations were from. While this show had a little more depth than Burgess's fictional game show, he still saw it as the reduction of literature to a game, noting that free of context, the source of the extracts often eluded the writers. John Gross, for example, was unable to recognise a passage from Saul Bellow's Herzog, even though he had judged it worthy of an international award. In 1982, Burgess wrote about television for the American listings magazine TV Guide, bemoaning its simplistic take on the world. Few will deny that television forms part of the educative process which makes adults out of children, and that they are induced to impose television values on their lives. We are all made of what we read, hear and see, and what we read, hear and see had better be good, else we are in trouble. We may conceivably put to rule over us a president whose image we first encountered in a bee film, not in a production of Hamlet, and whose simplistic characterizations we identify with reality. Reality is not Dallas. But we are in danger of wanting reality to be Dallas because of our hankering after simplicity. Life, of course, is far from simple. In many ways, this can be seen as a precy of one hand clapping satirical narrative. The simplicity of the depiction of Janet and Howard's lives can be seen as televisual, ruled by commercials and the superficial shows they interrupt. Even when faced with Howard's epiphany that the whole world is rotten and superficial, Janet can only process the drama in televisual terms. It was a bit too much like a TV play or a film for me to take in still what Howard was driving at. And very slowly it was starting to dawn on me that Howard had perhaps gone a bit crackers. The result of his having this photographic brain so long. And now it was catching up with him. But I still couldn't take it in as though it were real. It was something on the TV as far as I was concerned. Yet One Hand Clapping only presents this critical view of television. In reality, Burgess's relationship with the small screen was far more nuanced. While he was anxious about the reductive and simplifying effects of television, he was also heavily involved in the production of content. During the last 20 years of his life, he wrote the miniseries Moses the Lawgiver, Jesus of Nazareth, and A.D. Anno Domini, for which he also wrote the music. He also worked as the script consultant on Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. There are also many unproduced television scripts on subjects ranging from Attila the Hun to Sigmund Freud. Burgess also worked as a television critic, writing a regular column for The Listener, in which he admits he was hooked on The Prisoner, a fan of Tony Hancock, who as a comic artist he says is undertaking the noblest work of God, and expresses his delight in 1964 at the newly established BBC Two. This more nuanced view of television that Burgess reveals in his criticism assists in seeing one hand clapping as more than just a book about the evils of the small screen. Really, Burgess is using the story of Janet and Howard to criticise the increasing commerciality, greed and anti-intellectualism of contemporary culture. This is made overt when Janet remembers her school days. None of the teachers knew very much about what they taught and... It was pathetic sometimes, the way that they tried to make our school days happy. There was young Mr Slesser with the beard, who said he was a beatnik and called us cats and chicks. He was supposed to teach English, but said, like, 
He didn't dig the king's jive, crazy man, real cool. It was pathetic. Mr Thornton, who taught history, said he knew we wouldn't be interested in all those old kings and queens and just played his guitar and sang very dull songs. So we weren't allowed any history. And I was good at that at primary. Burgess portrays Janet as a product, or more accurately victim, of her commercialised time. Importantly, she is not portrayed as an idiot, but as lacking the opportunity to develop her own inbuilt intelligence despite the desire to improve. This desire manifests itself in strange ways, as she is seduced by the poet Redfer's Glass. Glass portrays himself as a man of culture and learning, yet he is not the crusading hero of the novel, rather an arrogant and drunken freeloader. He is based on the poet Dylan Thomas, who is reported to have had an affair with Burgess's first wife, Lynn. Burgess hints that Glass is a plagiarist and a peddler of unoriginal verse, another casualty of the superficial and anti-intellectual world surrounding the characters. Yet one hand clapping does not succumb to didactic rhetoric. Janet is one of Burgess's most memorable narrators, and her humorous and straightforward language encourages the reader not to fall into Howard's despair at the modern world. Tremor of Intent, published in 1966, shares its beginnings with one hand clapping amidst the tannery stench of Bradcaster, but leads to a luxury cruise of the Adriatic populated by secret agents, intoxicating women and obscene gluttons. The position at the moment is as follows. I joined the gastronomic cruise at Venice as planned, and the Polyolbion is now throbbing southeast in glorious summer Adriatic weather. Everything at Poole is in order. Dia arrived three days ago to take over, and it was good to have a large, vinous night out and talk about old adventures. I am fit, well, fit except for my two chronic diseases of gluttony and satiriasis, which, anyway, continue to cancel each other out. There will be little opportunity for either to be indulged on this outward voyage. We shall be in the Black Sea the day after tomorrow, but I dribble at the glutinous thought of the mission accomplished, unbuttoned with relief week that will come after the turnaround. Istanbul, Corfu, Villefranche, Ibiza, Southampton, and then free. Finished. Me, anyway, but what about Paul Roper? Dennis Hillier is a secret agent sent on one final mission by MI6 to recover his old school friend and rocket scientist, Edwin Roper from Russia, where the latter has defected. Under the guise of a mild-mannered typewriter technician, Hillier sails from Venice to the fictional Crimean port of Yaroljuk on a luxury cruise, only for his cover to be blown in a series of catastrophic events. In the United States, Tremor of Intent was subtitled An Eschatological Spy Novel, highlighting the theological grounding of the narrative, Often used as an apocalyptic term, eschatology is described by Burgess as to designate the ultimate realities, God, the devil, hell, heaven. As Hillier's journey continues, he questions the importance of the Catholic faith he abandoned in his school days at St Augustine's Catholic College in Bradcaster, a close analogue of Burgess's own alma mater, Zavarian College, in Manchester. Burgess describes his experience of the Zavarian brothers in Little Wilson and Big God, the big brother who ruled the school was Brother Martin. It was to be a disturbing name, like Adolf, for the greatest figure in Reformed religion is Martin Luther. His true name was Eugene McCarthy, which, the secular state not acknowledging the nomenclature of sanctity, he had to sign on official documents. He was, of course, Irish, with a long Irish head and a long Irish neck, and bouts of Irish neurosis. To join the Zavarian order entailed a vow of celibacy, but not one of temperance. Brother Martin had bottles in his rooms and access to a very decently stocked cellar. In Tremor of Intent, Brother Martin is recast as the zealous Father Byrne, who often smells of neat whiskey, yet has no time for the nocturnal sins he believes his charges are committing. On various occasions, having felt under the bedclothes with special lavishness, he would stand at the end of our dormitory to deliver a sermon on the evils of sex. 
He had a fine Irish instinct for the dramatic, and instead of turning on the lights, he would illuminate his ranting face with a pocket torch. The decorated saint's head brave above a kind of hell glow. One night he began with, The damnable sex, boys! Ah, you do well to writhe in your beds at the very mention of the word. All the evil of our modern times springs from unholy lust. The act of the dog and the bitch on the bouncing bed. Limbs going like traction engines. The divine gift of articulate speech diminished to squeals and groans and pantings. It is terrible, terrible, an abomination before God and his holy mother. Lust is the fount of all other deadly sins, leading to pride of the flesh, covetousness of the flesh, anger in the thwarting of desire, gluttony to feed the spent body to be at it again, envy of the sexual prowess and sexual success of others, sloth to admit enervating daydreams of lust. Only in the married state, by God's holy grace, is it sanctified, for then it becomes the means of begetting fresh souls for the peopling of the kingdom of heaven. Father Burns' rant provides the foundation to the plot of the novel. Hillier, long out of Catholic school, gradually succumbs to each of Burns' deadly sins. Pride in the scarred flesh of his own body, covetousness of a very young fellow passenger on the boat, the gluttony of the competitive banquet that he shares with the shadowy Mr. Theodorescu, envy of his friend Roper's voluptuous wife, and so on. Burgess allows Hillier to engage in the same lustful and indulgent behaviour as a more familiar spy, James Bond. Unfortunately, Hillier's Catholic upbringing accompanies such behaviour with a strange sense of guilt. Looking at Tremor of Intent as a spoof or parody of Fleming's Master Spy reveals it to be a much more complex novel than it first appears. Burgess, a very different novelist from the journalistic Fleming, uses the conventions of the Bond novels to examine a divided Europe and the complex political ties between nations. Fleming, according to Burgess, had patriotic motives that were hidden behind a desire to entertain. The world of espionage in Tremor of Intent is far from that of Bond, who loyally operates for Queen and Country and can be seen as an extension of a heroic Great British identity. Hillier, on the other hand, is not a heroic character. He is devious, conniving, self-serving and does not have any security in the nihilistic and disloyal world of espionage. Even his paymasters might be out to get him. Rather than heroically saving the day by killing the villain, armed with a permissive licence, Hillier tricks a man to his death in order to protect himself. Bond is always in control, yet Hillier lacks this trait even as he shares Bond's appetites for drink and women. But Hillier's appetites are slightly mutated, as this extract shows. There was time enough for Hillier to make delicate love to Clara's cabin, an extension of herself. First, though, he put out his tongue at the sex books, bundled them, struggling to be free in his arms, and then hurled them out into the starboard night. The illiterate sea took them as indifferently as a Nazi bonfire. Then he padded round with tiny steps, stroking hairbrushes against his hands and face, prickly male kisses but proxies of hers, sniffing her unguents and the pancake makeup and too mature perfume. There were stockings on the chair of a gunmetal colour, and he tried to strangle himself with them, at the same time chewing the dampish feet. She took size nine. He hesitated about burying his face in the underwear in the drawer or taking a drink of tap water from a shoe that poked out from beneath the bed, size four. The calm of an army was the anger of a people. Love, for that moment, must be the purpose blazoned on a war poster, not the tremor of the trigger finger. Fleming's Bond has his excessive appetites, yet Hillier, perhaps corrupted by the fire and brimstone of Father Burns' sermons, or by his own satiriasis, has little control over himself. This is Burgess satirising some of the more dubious exploits of Bond. Take, for instance, Fleming's The Spy Who Loved Me, 
where the love scene is described in terms of semi-rape, and in Casino Royale, where Bond imagines that any sex with Vesper Lynn would have the sweet tang of rape. Hillier's antics reveal him to be a ridiculous and ineffectual pervert, rather than the cold and predatory Bond. Burgess's description of Hillier's appetites is comic, yet Fleming romanticises Bond's masculine excess. This sort of excess is also parodied in the banquet scene in Tremor of Intent, where Hillier engages in a competitive meal with the pederast and glutton, Mr Theodorescu. Burgess speaks of Fleming's fiction as a banquet of the senses. This translates into a literal banquet that, despite its overblown images of gluttony and indulgence, reflects Fleming's own writing. Mr Theodorescu is a typical Bond villain, larger than life in both character and body, easy to identify, a Blofeld-esque bald head in this case, with a hubristic revelling in his own villainy. The banquet is a face-off between Hillier and Theodorescu, an over-exaggerated version of Bond's Baccarat duel with Le Chiffre in Casino Royale. Added to this scene is Hillier's guilt at the sheer indulgence of it all. Theodorescu poured Hillier a wonderful chill tumbler of frothing blanquette. Hillier felt better after it. He was able to take some chocolate rum dessert garnished with whipped cream and Kahlua, also some orange marmalade crème bavoir, loud with Cointreau. How about some apple tart normand with Calvados? asked Theodorescu. But Hillier had an apocalyptic vision of his insides, all that churned mess of slop and fibre, cream sluggishly oozing along pipes, the flavouring liqueurs ready to self-ignite a frothing in a sea of souring wine. A small Indian township could have been nourished for a day on it all. This was the West that Roper had deserted. Burgess's publisher suggested the removal of these scenes of excess in order to make the novel more conventional, but Burgess was not interested in writing a straight thriller. Not only can the novel be viewed as a parody of Fleming, it also doesn't share Fleming's political vision. Far from viewing the USSR as the ultimate source of all the world's evil, as Fleming did in his novels, Burgess has a more nuanced view largely inspired by his trip to Leningrad in 1961, his positive experiences of Russia influence the complex state of Europe in Tremor of Intent. Evil doesn't come from one place, but from everywhere, even Britain. Burgess describes his trip to Russia in literary terms in You've Had Your Time. No novel reader would believe how easy it all was. The stereotypical USSR of polished police efficiency and fundamental ill will, Frederick Forsyth's stuff, was what popular fiction needed. But, of course, I could not produce popular fiction. Other literary influences on Tremor of Intent emphasise Burgess's desire to write a complex and original thriller. James Joyce is evoked as Hillier dozes while reading, and the words morph into Joycean gibberish. Graham Greene is alluded to, particularly the power and the glory in which a priest is forced to preach undercover in anti-Catholic Mexico. And the name of the ship, Polly Albion, comes from the Tudor poet Michael Drayton's topographical poem of the same name. This brew of literary references and allusion creates a foundation on which Burgess can build his discussion of Catholicism, the nature of sin, and the state of contemporary Europe. It just so happens that Burgess disguises this as a thrilling and funny adventure story. One Hand Clapping and Tremor of Intent have recently been republished by Serpent's Tale, along with Burgess's dystopian vision 1985. This set of books is illustrative of the creative breadth of Burgess's fictional project and shows that his writing often transcended generic limitations. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast was written and narrated by Graham Foster. Readings were by Ben Jewell, Lenny Murphy and Adam Uray. All of the music was composed by Anthony Burgess. For more information, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.